and sort of off to the side that uh, this evening I'm in the unusual position of being one of the speakers and the moderator. So I won't do much moderating, but I'll just uh, maybe suggest that usually the way this works is that uh, the panelists sort of have a, a conversation um, for the first half of the round table and then we uh, open it up to, to questions. Um, and usually it's best, I think, if uh, the people who didn't speak in the afternoon begin. So if one of the three of you want to start us off with um, an intervention of your own or a question concerning one of the papers, either, either way, uh, feel free. Hmm? I can as well, actually. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, I just had a query about your account of um, late modernist artistic practice having a problem with modernism because everything had been done before. Because you posit late modernism as starting from 1950s, so that doesn't take into account conceptual, conceptual art practices at all, structures, filmmaking, expanded cinema, anything like that. So I would suggest that the, the, the problem actually comes sort of post failure of 68 and um, failure of revolutionary practice rather than mm. modernism itself. Well, I mean, um, I think that uh, as I tried to say a little bit, I really conceive of those um, very artificial distinctions um, on a real sliding scale. So that for me, it, it doesn't have so much to do with the sort of subjective comportment of the artist or the writer toward modernism itself, but rather just with the structural fact that the heroic moment of the avant-garde um, from, let's say, you know, 1895 um, to 1925 <clears throat> has sort of come and gone. And the avant-garde has become uh, an institution and it has become part of, you know, art history and part of literary history. And, uh, and given that, that there's just a structural fact of a certain belatedness, you know, which of, it's a very common account of thinking about um, the history of modernism and its relation to sort of subsequent generations, and uh, so, it's, so I don't mean to situate it in 1950 um, in any sort of determinate way, but rather just to think about the sort of movement of, of modernism from that early heroic phase into later work and to call that later work in some sort of sliding scale late modernism rather than uh, postmodernism. So for me, it's, it's not a question of like emphasizing some firm break in 1950, but on the contrary, undoing the rather firm break which is implied by the term postmodernism and thinking um, of the work in a more sort of slippery relation to, uh, to modernism. As for, um, it's very interesting what you say that, um, that there's, uh, that we could maybe think about different ruptures in the history of um, our practices in the 20th, 20th century on sort of different, you know, nodal points and so after May 68 is more important for reasons that are very different than any sort of break which is correlated to the war or to, you know, the end of the heroic moment of the avant-garde in the 1920s. And I think that I would be very um, open to those different ways of thinking about the periodizing logic. All I mean to do is sort of replace the large category of postmodernism and of postmodernity um, with an account of late modernity that can sort of take account of a, sub, a structural kind of substrate of the work that was called postmodern and think of it rather uh, as included in the history of modernity, you know, and, and to think of its relation to modernism also as included within the history of modernity. So, yeah, I mean, debates about, about how exactly one divides up important moments in the history of 20th century art, um, I wouldn't want to be very dogmatic about at all. Not so much what I was getting at. It was your sort of suggestion that everything had been done. I mean, I think ah, well, if you, I mean, if you, I mean, you know, some, so for example, if you take structuralist filmmaking, especially in, in the UK, uh, someone like Malcolm McGrice would absolutely say that what he was doing in terms of, you know, turning the projector back to the audience, you know, making the apparatus um, present in the space and kind of actually a performative object. Is I mean he would say that's a modern that, that is modernism that's not mm -hmm. yeah I have again so late modernism for me is a kind is is uh, included within a certain in a certain way as the term sort of indicates right it's just an adjectival modifier but within a history of modernism and I think that um, I, I certainly I agree that there are radical innovations in the arts in the second half of the twentieth century and up to you know uh, the nineties or now 
Um, and I don't mean to say that um, uh, the project of the avant-garde or its historical vocation <clears throat> is in any way exhausted. I just mean to say that there is a sort of early and heroic moment of modernism, which I would never, which I would not call high modernism in any sort of polemical way. But that, um, but that happens, and that then uh, subsequent generations of artists do have to um, think through their practice in relation to. You know, that is to say, they're not in the. It's a very classic. Yeah. About whatever came before. Sure, but um, but it's different when what came before, I think, is um, is the radical experimental practice of modernism, rather than, for example, the position that a that a poet like <clears throat> Ezra Pound is in, for example, mm -hmm. is that his you know antagonist. Of course, he's working in very in a very close relation to a poet like Browning. So it's not mm -hmm. that there's just like the Victorians over there or something who are, you know, these horrible people. But he is positioning his work in a very polemical way against Georgian poetry in the early 20th century. And also he's positioning his work against, you know, in relation to Vera Libre, but also against um, a kind of tradition of iambic pentameter in English poetry. Um, and working with, you know, a poet like Whitman to think about how to, uh, after a poet like Whitman to think about how to, you know, reconfigure the line and measure the line without standard um, meter. And I just think that, uh, so the relation of, um, the polemical relation of Pound to uh, his predecessors or his cultural context is very different than, let's say, the relation of a poet like um, Charles Olson to Ezra Pound. So writing a generation later in the late 40s and the 50s and thinking about his practice in relation to Pound and being in complete solidarity um, with Pound's poetic project in the 20th century, but also having to conceptualize his practice as, you know, in terms of what hasn't been done by the first, you know, generation of modernist, of modernist artists and writers and thinking like what remains to be thought through in the way that we address poetic form. So it's not at all that everything has been done and ah, we're belated and tired, but just rather like having the kind of relation to modernism where one has to think about what's been done um, by modernist experimentation and how in solidarity with that history um, one has to conceive of what is yet to be done in relation to that history. And I think that, that it's possible to call that um, late modernism uh, because it does operate um, under the, under the historical premise, you know, that something like modernism has taken place as something like, I, I believe, you know, a real break in the history of, of art and the history of literature. I mean, for me, it's, there isn't really a continuum, you know, from the 19th century through the 20th century, or from the early 19th century through the 20th century. For me, there is a real break that is instituted, um, you know, by Cezanne, by a poet like Pound, you know, which is very, or by someone like Alfred Jarry, you know, um, and it's very important to mark that for me. I wonder if you can use the same approach then with a tendency, something like recycled cinema, which has been, you know, around and also been using it since the early 20th century. Yeah. And it sort of still has the same impulse today, whether or not you're, you know, Cornell's dumpster diving and finding like the Rose Hobart film and cutting every frame and putting her in it, or whether you're Darabin Mam who's stealing tapes from a television studio, which is, you know, really, I mean, her work is, she positions it, plus she's been positioned as a postmodern mm -hmm. artist. But like, essentially, the, the impulse with recycled cinema, whether that's celluloid, digital, now kind of like internet-based, like CG technique, pulling, stealing images or whatever, it kind of like resists that periodization in some way. Sure, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know, you know, I know practically nothing about the work that you're talking about and you know a lot about it, you know. So tomorrow when you guys speak about that, I'll be very interested to, to try to think through how it relates to um, aspects of the periodizing logic that I'm trying to put forth. But I'm, I'm very concerned to avoid uh, any, sort of, any sort of claim that um, the very rough schema that I drew up accounts for um, all aesthetic phenomena in the late 20th century in any way, you know. And for me, the, um, the periodizing categories that I'm sort of working with in terms of late modernity or late modernism, uh, in a way it's not really my own periodization, but rather um, that I've thought through in my own terms, but rather engaged in a certain critique of Jameson.
and simply sort of, uh, you know, taking some periodizing work that he's done, rethinking what it can account for, um, and thinking about what the, what the consequences for historical thought are of altering the terms of his categories. So I'm not very concerned um, to, you know, construct a periodizing account uh, that can account in some sort of grandiose way for um, a cultural dominant in the way that Jameson is, but rather just to think through um, what his own account doesn't, doesn't, isn't able to tell us about other things that are going on in the 1980s, etc. And I'm sure that can be done with the terms I'm working with as well. Yeah. What intrigued me by the way you, you formulate this is that um, so you emphasize what's already been done and so the modernisms that come after that are shaped in a sense by this anxiety of influence maybe which has been used in other kinds of contexts. Um, but, but it's only late as opposed to say later or, or building on or something if you in fact are investing quite a lot in the notion of its imminent demise right? Right. That, there, that modern you know, modernity is facing its imminent collapse, it's a matter of time, it might be, you know, of course you're not going to put a date on it, but it's, it's, it's invisible and it's imminent and it's coming. Which is, um, and why? Well, because capitalism is going, to be, is going to be destroyed by its own internal contradictions, and, but not because modernity or the resources of modernism have been exhausted. That's the usual narrative, mm -hmm. right, is that you can't make, how, how many white canvases can you draw? I mean, or there's, yeah, there's I a mean, certain I'm... exhaustion. Whereas you're not saying that, you're no, saying... No, I'm not. Okay. But again, that's my problem is, what is the relation then between modernity and, and capitalism? And it just, it feels to me that you're relate, that it is essentially redundant. What you, your real category is capitalism, and a, a, you know, a, a, an account of capitalism is driven by contradictory dynamics that will destroy it. Um, and that can be reconstructed by an adequate structuralist account of those dynamics. But that then, modernity is just this, essentially, in a, like in a, a, the expression of that in the domain of culture, or the representation of those dynamics in this other sphere, which you really, you don't really need. You know, it doesn't have its own logic, it doesn't have its own, I mean, there's no reason why, for example, all the other things we talked about in terms of modernity should be exhausted. Like the project, for example, of mass literacy, or, or why the capacity for urban forms of collaboration or living together should be exhausted, or just because they happen to coincide with a certain stage of real subsumption. I mean, that that doesn't follow at all, it seems to me. So I, yeah, I'm there I'm still, I guess here's my, my main question for you for your, from your talk was, certain things you basically said, they, modernity is the history of capitalism. You know, it essentially is capitalism, or a facet of it at least. And in other ways you said there are these verbs, rather abstract verbs, that tether it or or relate it, or, or uh, index it, or something like that, to capitalism. And there, it has to be one or the other. Either it's, it has an aspect of capitalism, in which case it expresses some feature of it, I would say, or even if that, what it's expressing is structurally contradictory and so on. Uh, or this tethering, correlating, relating is an actual mediating process, in which case there is a complexity, the kind of complexity that, you know, uh, that Evan was talking about, for example, in which case you have to maybe address that as such, it seems to me. That's maybe also what Victoria's talking about. Like there, in, in other words, isn't there, what, what is the relative autonomy of these processes of tethering and indexing and so on? And do they have their own history and complexity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, To make a, to try to make a kind of formal point, I would say that what I'm calling modernity is something like the history of the social transformations that accompany the development of capitalism as a process of modernization. And uh, so, if we say that um, that there are phenomena of you know that emancipatory politics in a certain register one that's importantly linked to you to ideals like freedom and equality and a certain relation between those and uh, the democratic state. Um, of course, there may be aspects of um, those emancipatory projects which will uh, continue after the end of capitalism. Um, in my opinion, they will continue in a radically transformed way. How could they not? And in a way which is um, 
so radically transformed, uh, in fact, that um, we lose much more than we gain um, by saying that modernity will have a continuous history that will exceed the end of capitalism. For me, modernity is the name of, the, of those social and political transformations that accompany the history of the development of capital as a process of modernization. Therefore, by definition, it cannot exceed and continue beyond the end of capitalism. And an important way of a consequential um, you know, implication of that for me bears upon this question of the relation of revolution, as I said, um, to taking over and collectivizing the means of production. So if we say that you know, the modernization process, that, that modernity continues after the end of capitalism, then we can think that our, you know, that, uh, that the vocation of revolution is to collectivize the, the means of production and to use the productive capacities of capital um, in a way which is, for example, egalitarian and, uh, um, you know, based upon ideals of freedom and equality rather than a structure of exploitation. In my view, there's just certain concrete problems of reproduction, actually, that present themselves in that way of thinking. For example, information technology and the networks um, in which it's involved are massively structurally predicated upon capitalist exploitation to such an extent that I do not believe that it would be possible that, that reproducing information technology and being able to use it um, is something that requires uh, the reproduction of those networks and the reproduction of um, the production process itself in a way that I believe at this point is constitutively capitalist and could not be reproduced um, in a way which is communist or collective or that doesn't involve the form of exploitation. Why? Why? So these are... Um, <clears throat> why? Did why? you want to... Are you saying why as I'm well? Agreeing with, I just want to hear the, yeah, the answer to why. Uh, because such a thing would involve a nearly simultaneous and completely global um, coordinated revolutionary process that would need to uh, occur at a level of organization and coordination, which I believe is um, completely uh, unfathomable in relation to what the, that revolutionary process would have to be like. That is to say, it would have to involve um, an enormous amount of chaos. It would have to involve an enormous amount of destruction. And I don't believe that uh, basically the technological basis of the means of production are any longer at a scale that can be reproducible under the forms of management that would be required. Um, to sustain those networks and those processes of technical production at a global level of organization. I mean, that's a speculative judgment, but it is my judgment. And I think that, and I, and I think that um, you know, that, that's, that thinking about um, the reproduction of a process of production and a means of production like that which is operative now is radically different than thinking about um, seizing the means of production and collectivizing them um, at the level of you know, the factory in the early 20th century or in the, in the late 19th century. Um, and I think that we have to take that, uh, that degree of complexity that's involved in the capacity to reproduce those things and we have to weigh it against the managerial apparatus that would be necessary to do it, which I believe would be completely counter-revolutionary. Um, so that's why. Um, but that's not, uh, it's not an answer which is in, in any way involves some kind of um, logical necessity. Um, it's my evaluation of a concrete state of affairs, a historical state of affairs. But can't it be done on a, on a small scale? Yeah, but if you think about <clears throat> the reproduction of something like the World Wide Web cannot be done on a small scale, right? Um, different, sure. different ways of using you know, computers or using technology, of course, can be done on a small scale. But what I'm talking about is um, collectivizing the capitalist process of production as it exists now. No, that can't be done on a okay. small scale. I have a slightly different tack, but a question I do want to pose about, maybe this is to hammer on a point, but I actually do think that you are collapsing modernity and capitalism 
in a way that for me is not quite functional. And here's why. You said that modernity is the set of social conditions that accompany the development of, of capitalism. The social the transformation okay. of okay. social well, here, Okay, good. Well, yeah. like, you know, Marx, you know, as you know, like, the book's called, like, Das Kapital, not, you know, capitalism, but, like, capital. And capital, as we know, is not an economic fact, but is itself a social relation. So all that capitalism designates is the social and historical and material complex that supports and makes possible the reproduction of that social relation. And so basically, what you're talking about is simply the development of that, right? So that is just best capitalism in that sense, which is exactly the definition of modernity. Why would it be important to have a differing definition of that? Well, because there are a number of influences and countercurrents and things that don't quite take and kind of moments that come and pass and inputs that I really think, you know, well, I'm obviously remain a Marxist, like, I think it's extraordinarily labyrinthine to try to reverse engineer them on a certain story we have about the development of value as a social relation. And this involves, you know, for example, the fact that the story you told, which, you know, I'm in agree agreement with for a fair amount of it, but, you know, as we know, that's a story driven by an extraordinarily small portion of the world until we hit the 20th century, this is the capitalist core. And, you know, I'm very wary of something like accounting for a set of uh, influences into modernity or the modern that can't take into account more seriously uh, influences of kind of like Islamic or Arabic thought, uh, encounters with sort of other trading circuits and all that you can't in a serious way say are accompanying the rise of capital. They may be incorporated into it, but they are undergoing a set of transformations that are not doomed and or destined to end in capital. So, you know, that's only to say that like I want to hold on to a category of modernity that's wider because I think, you know, while of course we can flesh out the chart and all, like I do think about this in conversations, I often have people who are more, you know, kind of anarchists of a sort, and there'll, there'll sometimes be a weird crosstalk where it's like, anarchists are like, state, you know, and then we're like, no class, right? And the point is that we're in a sort of a weird moment where um, we have to understand that there are a set of, yeah, historical transformations that are not especially determined by capital we might want them to be, especially as we enter a period in which the reproduction of value, which was to say also during a period of industrial profitability, when you could basically dodge the bullet of overaccumulation and or saturation of markets, right? You enter a period where it's harder and harder to read everything via that optic. Now we can in certain ways, we have to understand, you know, that there are ongoing sort of transformations and frictions and all that like you know, it just, it doesn't quite work to assume that they are, you know, and you can say like, oh, I'm not saying they're determined by, but in a certain sense, this logic is, uh, is given is, The thing is actually that I'm, but it's, it's a real point that I'm actually not saying determined by, right? So, and it's, it's very important to, um, to grant that point because otherwise the conversation just collapses um, into, uh, into a very, just a very old argument, which is not very interesting. So I'm not saying determined by. That's constitutive of my account. And I'm and I'm and I'm not saying that. Um, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm not talking about being able to reverse engineer, as you put it, um, the political and economic, or the political and sort of cultural transformations that go by the name of you know that are associated with the name of modernity back into their sort of like economic causes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying. Again, I'm offering a formal definition that I would really like to hold on to the integrity of. Um, the modernity is the set of social and political transformations that accompany the history of capitalism as a process of modernization. Now, if you think <coughs> that... Well, what's um, the word modernization on, doing on, in that on, the second time in this sentence? That if, that if you think that, um, uh, well, the development, for example, of uh, industrial technology, etc., but um, urbanization, you know, Etc. But um, but if you think that um, that the history of the global South since uh, the 16th century is not um, conditioned by certainly not determined by but conditioned by the history of the development of capital, well then we certainly disagree, right? No, so so, so, to, so to speak about the Middle East or to speak about Islam um, or to speak about the global South. Uh, is not to say anything that can't be grappled with by saying, I'm talking about the set of social and political transformations that accompany the history of capitalism as a process of modernization. And uh, 
it's not some, it's, it's, just, to, it's just to think that uh, there's a certain period of time during which what goes by the name of modernity is unfolding and uh, it's a radically discrepant, discontinuous, uneven <clears throat> phenomenon. Um, and uh, at the same time, the capitalist you know, mode of production is developing and there's a very tight uh, relation, I think, between those. I, re I refuse um, to come down and say either the two have nothing to do with one another or that they're so overdetermined that in fact it's useless to think about them in relation to capitalism, nor will I say that they are strictly determined by it. And so the, the effort to push an account which tries to think the historical conditioning of modernity by capital into a determinist account, I view as a really, um, as quite a reactionary uh, intellectual maneuver actually, and it happens all the time, and um, it's very easy, uh, and I don't think it's very interesting. I, I thought you're, go ahead. No, no, no. You're, you're avoid, I think you're, you're trying to have it both ways. You're trying to say, on the one hand, that Madrid, I'm trying to have an account of discrimination, say, and that is to have it both ways, indeed. Well, but then you're avoiding the kind of discrimination. So the verbs you use are either it's associated, or they're accompanying with... Accompanying, yes. Okay, accompanying. Before they're tethered to, or correlated to, or indexed by. Accompanying, I mean, that, it, it's a very... It doesn't... It's, as you say, you don't want to try and explain it. So it's, a, it's on one hand... It's not an explanatory on one hand, scheme. So like, okay, yeah. The Reformation accompanies early development of capitalism, and that's true. I mean, they happen chronologically at the same time. If you accept that the, you know, the industrial revolution that you mentioned is indeed early capitalism, and that's plausible enough. But does what is it? Um, it seems to me that the, what is the point of doing this exercise of, of showing that, for example, the Enlightenment, in its distinctive, you know, situated, complex, contradictory processes, you know, what? It, it, the, the issue is how to explain it, how to understand it, how to understand its promise, its limitations, and so on. It, but I think, you're, I think you're misunderstanding the burden of my um, paper and, and um, associating it with a kind of discourse in which it doesn't participate. That is to say, I'm not, I'm not giving a... Um, it's not a history paper. I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything like um, explain the Enlightenment. I'm trying to uh, periodize, for one thing, um, artistic production in a way that's very different than, than Jameson does, but which is very closely associated with it at the same time. And so to situate something um, and to periodize something is very different than to sort of explain the causes of the Enlightenment. So if I situate um, a particular... Um, <clears throat> if I think it's important, for example, to situate the artistic productions of modernism in relation not only to so-called urbanization or the culture of speed, etc., but also to situate those phenomena which go under the name of modernity in relation to a, uh, you know, a first fully operative phase of real subsumption and in turn to um, relate that to uh, the way in which the contradictions that are working out um, between, you know, the relation between absolute and relative surplus value, between, uh, you know, the distribution of capital into constant capital and variable capital. If I think it's important to sort of, um, uh, to think in this sort of foundational Marxist way, this kind of orthodox Marxist way, about these categories um, and these phenomena which are very descriptive, um, which are always bandied about under the name of modernity, that's just because, you know, I think that it allows us actually to think in a more coherent and rigorous way about what goes on with the, the transformation of social relations um, in the second half of the 20th century in relation to the first, you know? But I'm in no way saying that, like, oh, the cantos is caused by real subsumption. I mean, this is just a totally vacuous and idiotic way of approaching cultural artifacts, you know? So it's uh, to situate something and, and explore its periodizing logic, or give it a periodizing label, is not to attribute, okay. is not to make a causal argument. I'll, I'll make a point one more time. It, I, if it was a causal argument, I in a way would be more comfortable with it, because I would understand a bit well, better what you meant. What, what it seems to me is you're vacillating between saying that it simply is capitalism. So the question of, of urbanization, for example, you said, simp I can't remember quite how you put it, but it was an aspect <coughs> of real subsumption. You situate it, as you say, you periodize it so that 
it falls at this moment. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that for me. Uh, all right. That on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have these other slightly more vague terms: accompany, correlate, whatever. Which, and, and I don't. Apart from the fact that they happen at roughly the same time, so a lot depends on how you no, on the process of naming, process of uh, periodizing, process of locating, situating, and so on. But just take the question of urbanization. On the one hand, part of me absolutely totally agrees with you. Yes, indeed. You know, you need, you know, the the that, that real assumption is a very large uh, determinant factor. I would say a causal factor in the concentration of labor in places like Lyon or Manchester and so on, in a way that's uncontroversial. On the other hand. It creates uh, contradictory potentials, right? So in Paris, in particular, but Lyon, other urban centers, Rouen, and so on, just to stick to France, you also get then new forms of urban organization that are explicitly anti capitalist Okay, but in other words, that and that take on different forms. So the Paris Commune, for example, is explicitly anti-capitalist form. So that by simply saying, you know, in other words, it doesn't explain. It seems to me very much about the distinctive, uniquely contradictory, emancipatory, but also com you know, compromised potential or something like urbanization, which is also a process of relative emancipation from the, you know... From but I mean, no way, I mean the, the reason that it doesn't explain that is because there's absolutely no way in which I'm trying to explain something like that. Okay. I mean, so, so, so just to, I mean, subsumption, you know, doesn't mean that um, the process of urbanization is subsumed by capital or something. It's simply a term in Marx which describes a certain relation between like absolute and relative surplus value. And so it's just a, it's not, there's nothing like real subsumption as like a real social, it's just the name of transformations in the capitalist mode of production, which as you note, it's impossible to even think about something like urbanization without understanding this as part sure. of the, as part of the process that breeds urbanization, that contributes to, um, that particular like social formation in the 19th century. And so the fact that that has contradictory political effects, of course it does. Okay. Everything about the relation between moder the social and political transformations of modernity and their relation to capitalism involves contradictory <coughs> phenomena and aspects. No one would ever, so, I mean, might, some people might, but I, I certainly, in no way do I mean to argue about anything like that. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to grasp exactly what the you can, Nathan but, but Petzard actually has been trying to for quite answer. some time. He's been insisting on. So. No, would be coming to you know just kind of shift the terrain of uh, what I'm missing. So what I actually was missing in your paper was the you had you had just the diet, let's say capitalism and then modernity. I was always thinking of how much let's say democracy is still. So to make really the perfect three up, how how much you have. Actually, you're missing it now. Of course, you sketched out your interest, in, let's say, in technology development, so, let's say, in aesthetic development, under the, let's say, the guidance of the of the Marxist uh, conceptualization. But let's say, what would interest me, in a sense, in also in some 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 respect, comes also, let's say, close to the question also to Peter. So, if then modernity is, we have to take its end, let's say, its closure as a revolutionary task, is some. Is this, is this the same valid for, for democracy? Yes, indeed. You are absolute on I mean, it. So it's no other democracy, so no other ways of democracy are coming up. I mean, they don't, the category of democracy is of no interest to me you know, politically. It's not, a, it's not an ideal um, or a political form that I think holds any radical potential. The rule, you mean the rule of the people? That's what it means, right? The demos, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're talking about, I mean, Petara is referring to a particularly, again, uh, a political form which emerges during modernity as a particular. Um, but you can as choose a, as a no, modern but, political but I think, I think also And I'm saying that, yeah, that I agree with a thinker like Love You, who says that democracy is the name of the enemy today. I completely, I have no problem with this argument. Um, so, yes, I think that. Uh, I think that exactly the destruction of a state of affairs in which that response to a question about democracy could in any way be scandalous or controversial is exactly what is necessary. That that is to say the sort of um, the deconstitution of the category of democracy as having a kind of as associated with um, uh, liberty and equality is something which I think is uh, 
yeah, an ideological uh, effect of, of modernity, and one which is not particularly interesting, and the, the sort of um, effects of which are everywhere manifest, you know. So, um, communism is what's interesting to me, and, the, and what communism is, is, is a very complicated and interesting and ambiguous uh, question, but um, uh, associating communism with the project of radical democracy or um, trying to think or practice democracy in a new way. Um, it's not a, a theoretical or practical problem which interests me. And I find that usually in political situations, uh, it again is, um, it's not a, it's not on the side, you know, of, of revolution, in my opinion. It's a counter-revolutionary uh, commitment. So, so but would you then say that even less than a relative autonomy, let's say, of arts, so then for your political history, let's say, of modernity is of no importance at all? It's no, I, mean, the, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know where these objections are coming from. There's nothing about the account that I gave that, um, that indicates that I reject the relative autonomy. Of okay, but here's okay. Let me. Can I explain why I think you're getting these questions? Sure. Okay, so you borrow uh, for initial contestation. You take on Jameson's schema, right? Yeah. And you could say there's broadly speaking, there's sort of three strands on the table here. One would be something like modernity, which even I'll, you know go along through here. We're saying something like a whole set of trans social transformations across. The, good five centuries or so, many of which we can think of it related to capital, some of which it's hard to see how, but nevertheless, there's that. So there's modernity, there's something like the history of capital, and then the third would be something like, based on Jameson's things, the idea that there's a cultural logic of these things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason you're getting all these questions about correspondence, uh, indexing, uh, accompaniment, etc., is that, you know, if you're going to bother even to engage with these three th threads, like the, the kind of critical task would be hopefully that it would, that thinking these three things together would tell us more about, let's say, two of them than just thinking one alone. This would be the account. So what worries, worries is putting it strongly, I don't really care, but like what I find odd is that when you switch into the logic of saying like here's modernism, modernism, and late modernism, when you're talking about pound, etc., the accounts you gave were radically divorced from the set of categories that you didn't say were determining or primary, but that you wanted to track out. And so at that point, I'm like, well, then why bother bringing them into the same place? So for example, the, the account you gave like McCarthy and Bayer and all, like, you know, I'm really interested, maybe, you know, this makes me Jamesonian or whatever, but like, actually, I do think that uh, large scale trends in, in, um, in cultural production actually do kind of elaborate and articulate uh, aspects of sort of social and economic experience that we don't often understand otherwise and it's really worth thinking about them but the account you're giving keeps saying like it's not determined by that it doesn't correspond directly and so I'm like then why periodize why periodize in that case if you are going to say there's not a connection there at that point it's just like write a history of modernism like a bloomian history of anxiety and write a history of capital but like if you aren't willing to say that there isn't an articulation between them then there's literally no point in putting them on the I'm same. I'm not page. saying there's not an articulation between. But, I, but give me an example. A, like I want to say, like there's not a causal. There's not a one-way causal relation. Sh but what you've very but, different. I know, but Nathan, but like James, I agree with you. The problems of Jameson's account of capital. But Jameson gives me a more convincing reading at the moment of these cultural objects than you've than you've given. You haven't given me many They're different the, cultural objects. I, I, I know, but the point is like the proof of the periodizing pudding is to show that, that's a terrible expression, is, <laughs> it's disgusting, is, is to show that, that there's a way in which a different logic, not the dominant the determining one, but something like a category of subsumption can make evident to us the yeah. historical particularity of a work that otherwise would not make that apparent to us. I guess I just don't think these things are a big deal. I mean, I didn't, let well, me, let me, no, I'll answer, I'll, answer, I'll answer your question, I'll answer your question, but I just, you know, today in my paper, obviously, I have, I'm, I'm attempting to establish a very general and extremely broad schema, which requires a good deal of explanation. I don't have very much time to talk about artworks. Uh, you know, I've been teaching this stuff, and doing three-hour seminars on like McCarthy or whatever and talking about this stuff at some length. I think that yields interesting results in some cases. The point for me about your question is just like surely we want to know as much about um, an artwork as we can, you know? So if we, if we can think about 
Surely we will want to know as much about the context of the production of an artwork as we can. If we can think about the relation uh, between the social and political transformations that go under the name of modernity, how those change in relation to uh, the history of capitalism, if we can think about art objects in relation to those two questions to do the three prongs of analysis that you mentioned, surely that's better than doing just two or one of them. Now, doing that, now doing that will put a certain burden on uh, uh, someone who does that kind of work. That is to say, it will make them um, appear as uh, something like a, perhaps like a determinist Marxist. Why? Because one is attempting to situate, you know, uh, an artwork in relation to capitalism. And certainly there are other ways of talking about artworks, which uh, in my, you know, in the sort of critical work that I've done in most of my writing um, has had very little to do uh, with situating art objects in this manner. But so the, the, just the fact that that's what I'm doing today, that, um, that that's one thing that has to be done, it's not a big deal. But that won't make sense. How could, like how a could one possibly maybe, talk maybe, about art This is the reason why... Without talking what, about its relation to capitalism. I know, of course. And no one is... Like, my pro the account you describe, in fact, the other one would not be determinist at all because it's willing to understand that there are a set of other histories within modernity that have, of course, they like run parallel. We know that the state is kind of dominated by the reproduction of capital and all, but the reason it wouldn't be determinist in a certain way is that it treats all three of these things as mutual fields of influence. That like there's ways, of, as we know, like kind of capital capitalizes profoundly on transformations in the cultural <clears throat> sphere. For example, like. You know, we don't want to overstate the case of postmodernism, but a critical category got a lot of purchase in the art world. A lot of smart people who were ad men were engaged in that. And actually, there are cultural works made, including on the mass scale, that we have to recognize as such, not because they come after capital, but because like that's a mode of cultural production that became really popular and had huge influence in the world. So while it's bullshit and leads to bad work, like it's a real force. You know? also, I mean, you know that I um, agree with you about this. There's, I mean, there's no, in, in nothing, I, I insist, really, that nothing that I said in my talk or the Q&A implies in any way or, or um, constrains me in any way to hold that art objects don't have historical effects. I mean, uh, indeed, you know, I'm arguing, I'm, t I'm talking about modernism in a way that I think is, is fully compatible with thinking, for example, about, you know, it, obviously their historical effects are often very minor, but I can certainly think about Ezra Pound and think about the Pisan Cantos in relation to his radio broadcasts and, you know, the relation between his work as an American artist and Italian fascism, and I can think about, you know, certain ways in which, like, that transforms a, a certain history of artistic production in the United States and how perhaps it transforms a certain um, historical sequence in the United States in a very minor way. Ah, it's not... Uh, you know, so again, thinking about that in relation to um, a periodizing logic that I've uh, that I've laid out in in three Marxist categories in no way implies that I'm giving a determinist account. The problem is simply rhetorical. The problem is that if you want to give an account that actually grounds periods periods of cultural production that actually draws them into relation with the history of capital, then you have to. You have to do all this very technical work in Marx, and you have to sort of like put something up like a graph like that, which makes it legible, and this comes to seem incredibly overbearing, and people freak out. But it's not, it's, it's again, to me, just like absolutely not a big deal. This is like, how could we do anything um, but include that sort of analysis in the way that we think about the history of art or the history of modernity? It's, uh, I, I, it seems, you know, extremely uncontroversial to me, unless one attributes to it an entire register of argument that in no way implies. Well, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'd like to come back to that, but Lexi has been waiting, and there was a question there. And... Well, I mean, I, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe this slightly will shift it somewhat, but I feel like what, I mean, what, what, what sometimes it gets lost, I think, in precisely what's motivating the intervention is the fact that modernity and also the, the sort of periodization of the modern is a highly you know, conflictual concept. Sure. And, it, and it's at the it's same time, history. I mean, it's, it, it's a long history, but at the same time, it's also a history that's, that in other words, it's not merely a question of describing what is in fact the case. Mm. It's also at the same time that description is itself an intervention into that history. Uh. So that is, in other words, it's not merely 
late, I mean, the way in which figures like Adorno, or for that matter, Jameson, are taking up these cultural objects, they're, they're, they're trying to pinpoint not only you know, a de determinations that allow it to be intelligible, but at the same time, openings within that field that allow us to actually cast critical light on the phenomena and mm -hmm. on tendencies within the current situation. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess what, what, what I'm interested in then is particularly your choice to challenge the concept of postmodernity mm -hmm. by means of a return to a kind of hyper periodization of the modern. Because there's been other accounts, you know, that I'm sure you disagree with that have also attempted to call into question the category of the postmodern. Yeah. So Ranciere, for example, has yeah. done so. I think, personally, I think in a very interesting way we could talk about it. I know you, you're not partial to it. But also the late Foucault, I think, mm -hmm. is very interesting in this regard, where he really tried to shift radically away from the very notion of the modern being a periodizing concept mm -hmm. and shift it through a reading of you know, Kant's text, What is Enlightenment, into a sort of understanding of ethos or attitude whereby suddenly, and this is what I think is interesting, is that in the 19th century, or maybe, I mean, we don't necessarily have to posit it there, there comes to be a, a new understanding of a practice that identifies itself as modern. And that, you know, and so Baudelaire in particular <coughs> wants to see modernity and being modern as a task, as a, as a yeah. project. That in itself, I feel like gets lost in some sense, especially when you no, want I to think. say that, I mean, I mean then yeah. I just want to hear your thoughts on it when you want to say that the end of capitalism is the end of modernity. I mean, did, I mean what's at stake then, in, in, un, in other words, in reaffirming precisely this notion of post-modernity, rather than it being a question of either radicalizing you know, tendencies within the modern, critical tendencies, because I think critique itself is also completely conditioned sure. by these historical processes that you wouldn't <coughs> want to necessarily do away with. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the... Uh, yeah. It's a it's a complex question, but I mean I could I take it that I'll co I'll come back to this the end of your question in a moment and just say something about the genesis of this uh, little project that I've been thinking about just for like eight months basically or a little longer than that but not in any rigorous way I mean it's uh, I started thinking about what it means to think about the end of modernity you know today rather than say in the nineteen seventies when I was reading Evan's book actually. And so thinking about Evan's argument about the relation between cyberpunk and salvage punk and thinking about um, the way in which Evan in that book is thinking about apocalypse as something which I, you know, I conceive as a kind of combined and uneven apocalypse to me means a sort of combined and uneven like demodernization is, is partly what I think the kinds of descriptions that Evan has given of what that process would look like entails, you know, and I was trying to think through that and I started thinking about it in relation to Jameson and thinking about, you know, the idea that post-modernity is something that will follow the end of capitalism rather than a, than a, a transformation that attends its late phase. Okay. When I, and I mean to, um, <clears throat> and then again, my, uh, the way that I think about these, um, the sort of art objects that I'm talking about is, is completely inductive. No one will fail to have noticed that these are things that I've already been like working on and thinking about stuff that I like, you know, and have been writing about for a few years. And, uh, and so it's inductive insofar as like, I'm trying to think about, you know, uh, how I might periodize that work, how I might relate my very discrepant interests in some of those different kinds of work um, and think about what holds them together. You know, so to come back to your point, I mean, in the contested history of the category of uh, modernity. So we have all these accounts, and we have accounts that are attacks upon Jameson, or the, at least that are contrary to Jameson's logic. So for example, Habermas's account of modernity as an unfinished project. Or for example, um, this sort of sociological account, um, which actually uses the term late modernity, um, and which talks about reflexive modernity, and um, <coughs> and also thinks about modernity as something which is not yet finished. There are aspects of that account that I agree with, but I don't agree with its sociological methodology or you know, its sort of descriptive apparatus at all. Um, and I think that uh, to come back to Baudelaire, the way that I'm thinking about, for example, the reflexivity of modernism is that that, you know, or to think about a declaration, um, one must be absolutely modern, you know, of, um, to, to think about that, uh, 
that sort of declaration or to think about Baudelaire. Um, where to be modern is a project and you no longer have, and this is something Jameson says, it's uh, the, the moment of um, the battle of the ancients and moderns has, as it were, been won. You know, and, and becoming absolutely modern is a sort of um, imperative of the new and of the avant-garde. And this is a moment where like, modernity becomes reflexive and takes on its own imperative to be modern. And that for me is what modernism is all about. And again, that's a perfectly sort of uh, standard you know, understanding of, of, of aspects of modernism. Now to think about that, in relation to the moment when um, real subsumption properly comes into its own and you have a properly capitalist production process, then that contextualizes that imperative to be absolutely modern in a certain way, a way which I find very interesting. That is, it happens at the moment when capitalism becomes, as it were, like actually capitalism, when you have a fully capitalist production process. And, uh, and I do think that there's a relation between them which has to be handled very carefully, and if one were going to talk about it specifically, um, through all kinds of, you know, very delicate uh, contextual work and, and contextual work that would have to be locally situated, etc. But, um, and so for me, you know, uh, to come back to the question of postmodernity um, from the sort of perspective, uh, you know, that I arrived at from thinking about Evan's book in relation to Jameson was just a way of accounting for the periodization of the present in a way that I didn't see happening in other accounts of modernity and that I thought Jameson's account was uh, partially adequate to but was, you know, sort of um, quite constrained by its own conditions of historical production in which it sort of seemed to make sense uh, to Jameson to call this postmodern or postmodernity without um, and having to force, you know, a relation between postmodernism and postmodernity that required him to make these absurd arguments about the total completion of the modernization process or its structural completion. And, uh, you know, so that's, I mean, I don't know if I, I think I sort of trailed off at the end there. I don't know if that's fully answering your question and if you want to repose it, um, you can. Um, but that's sort of what motivates the project anyway, if that's essentially what you're asking after. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's one facet of it. Um, I mean, I think the other facet is, is I mean, I think one of the one of the things that I find symptomatic is, I mean, of a certain understanding of modernism, and this is where I actually think that Ranciere's intervention is oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Is is that it, it, it introduces <coughs> into the logic of modernity and modernism a hyper obsession with periodization, mm -hmm. such that every little, every single transformation, every single thing. So it has to be some sort of radical break. Yeah. So that, I mean, what I, I guess the, the issue is, is then, I mean, why not, I mean, why, why not, I guess, hitch your, um, you know, hitch your interest, so to speak, to attempts that are then trying to complicate and rethink what is the modern, rather than necessarily like ratchet up this very periodizing because, logic. Because, I mean, because I think that, um, that those attempts, in certain ways, they certainly add something. But as an argument, um, for example, like against the category of modernity, you know, I mean, Rancière arrives at the capacity and the sort of will to make that kind of argument uh, because, you know, he's troubled by a certain kind of uh, what he thinks is a determinist Marxism and an effort to, you know, evade it. And he's troubled by like Althusser structuralism, etc. And he's very, and he's heavily influenced by Foucault. But what it leads to, you know, is a um, a complete severance of thinking about modernity in relation to capitalism at all. Actually, Rancière has no means at his disposal by which to think through the relation of his aesthetic regimes uh, to the history of capitalism. And so this is why I say in my paper last year that this ren renders it basically useless. You know, I mean, it might. It might add some things to the conversation, but as an account which one can take seriously, the fact that it doesn't have those means at its disposal uh, renders it to me more or less irrelevant. And I would say that with Foucault, you know, Foucault again, he doesn't, he isn't able to think uh, in any sort of rigorous or serious way or complex way 
the relation of the history of modernity to the history of capitalism. And so it's, um, those accounts are certainly of some interest, but they, but they cannot, uh, but the reason I don't invest myself in those accounts is because what I'm interested in thinking through better, you know, is the relation of modernity to the history of capitalism. Because I think that's extremely important. And I think it's not done adequately by thinkers like Jameson, who, who take up a book by Mendel, which is not that great a book, you know, and take up this very, you know, vulgar uh, periodizing schema and just say, these are my, like, three categories of realism, modernism, and postmodernism, which correspond to this. I mean, it's... So, so trying to do the Marxist work, actually, of, um, of periodization in a way that might make sense and actually be complicated. I mean, that's the task that I'm trying to do. So I, and I think that in terms of this obsession with periodization, yeah, sure, I mean, uh, I don't feel obsessed with periodization, for example. This is the first time that I've engaged it at all, you know? And I've never made these sorts of arguments in my thinking about art or philosophy. Um, however, as you note, you know, uh, there is an obsession with periodization, which is a sort of like cultural fact of modernity. These accounts exist. They're extremely influential, and um, we need to think about them. You know, but, but in and, terms uh, of and so and so making you know thinking about them part of the way that we think about intellectual history or art history. I mean, again, it doesn't seem like. A, like a big deal or some like claim that we must periodize and this is the right thing to do and like this is my methodology. It's simply uh, one project but, and another. I know, but the, the point, just, yeah. can I just respond to this quickly though? Cause I, yeah, but we also have a question from someone who has Well, can I just quickly like, okay. but you actually, you said like, okay, like you want to do this with a better marks, but what you, you gave though, doesn't actually do any of the periodizing links to, the, uh, to either modernity or modernism. What you did was gave, you gave a, a very, very good summary of TC with like a Brenner follow-up, which is not, you did not provide, like that's why, like I don't think it's, it's not that I doubt that there's space in this for these fleshings out, but I think what a lot of us are responding to is just like, I want to hear how <coughs> these things are like related to pick a kind of somewhat more neutral verb. Like I'm not hearing that in a way, you know, for example, like you could give an account of, like what is, what is um, real subsumption? What real subsumption also signifies quite interestingly is the moment where you have a transformation of processes by me in accordance with an abstraction that's no longer content to simply increase the pace or the intensity of that process, but actually where an abstraction enters the material sphere and utterly transforms processes. The factory is the literal crystallization of that. Now that's like a huge revolution in people's daily experience and the structure of kind of daily life and economy. If you're suddenly working in a factory, so the point is like, that's a real transformation and I'd be, you know, we could maybe say, or it seems to me worth asking after, like, oh, is there ways in which radical experiments in form, as well as an interrogation of formal, uh, of form by means of abstraction, a drive towards abstraction in art, might there be a relation there? Like, that, that would be of interest to me to hear about, but this is like, that's what I, well, of that's course what I want to hear more Of about. course there's a relation, but to do that work again, to do that work in a way which isn't stupid, one would have to spend a lot of time talking not just about abstraction, but about particular works of abstraction and uh, particular periods and phases of abstraction and taking very seriously their local context and all the mediations that you people are asking after. That is to say, the way in which uh, those practices and periods of artistic work are overdetermined. And that's just not what the paper about was you know, about today. If I wanted to like, think through, well, in what way would what I'm saying you know, bear upon the work of Maevich, I mean, that would be an interesting project to pursue, but there's simply uh, developing the lineaments of such a thing as, as that, you know, and explaining them happens to take up like around 45 minutes and it's unsatisfying. So, I mean, that's just, uh, if one is asking after like the, the book project that might attend something like the development of a schema, I mean, yeah, I'd like to write it up. But it's not something that you can just like do in five minutes, you know, because that would involve a kind of like Marxist determinism in which I have no interest. So it's, uh, you know, you're caught one way or the other, right? Yes, you do. But, okay, <laughs> I think, I think but uh, yeah, please. Also, my, also, the one thing I want to say is the account is not the same as TC. It's influenced by TC, but the periodization is different than TC's. But yeah. The argument you've made against us here uh, can also be made 
against Marx, and you insist on your analysis being rigorously Marxist, but Marx does not include the aesthetic sphere in, in this analysis. And uh, now there are various mm. theories about why he doesn't do that. But I think uh, that Adorno and uh, even Althusser, Althusser also in, uh, uh, singles out the aesthetic sphere when he discusses the ideological apparatuses, doesn't apply to the, to the aesthetic. Just like I think Rancière is here quite close to Althusser. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Marx as well. So what about, what, sorry, what exactly is the claim you're making about Marx? That Marx does not include mm -hmm. the aesthetic sphere uh, under these categories. Insofar the as he categories doesn't... categories do not apply to these things. Insofar as he doesn't talk about it? Or? No, no, no. The, You're the, saying he the, says... Theoretically, theoretically. Not that he didn't do this actual analysis, but that his concept of the aesthetic would leave them out. Exactly what text? It's in the Grundrisse. In, in German ideology, this is... Um, mm -hmm. There are two very good, um, but I cannot remember the name of the author, but this is in Critical Inquiry, two very long papers in the mid-90s on Marx, Marx in, uh, the, uh, Marxist, as opposed to Marxist aesthetics, um, claiming that basically, to, to cut a long story short, that Marx is a Kantian and not a Hegelian yeah. in, 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 in aesthetic terms, and that this um, that the Jameson, Jameson um, line of Marxist aesthetics is mistaken on this mm. point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when and where Marx says that, I disagree with him and I think he's wrong. You know, uh, when and where Marx says such a thing, I disagree with him and I think that he's wrong, just like I think he's wrong. About no, but the, no, but several when, times you've used it a rigorous Marxist Yeah, 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 yeah. But, that doesn't, but that doesn't mean that... Um, that doesn't mean that one has to say everything that Marx said and agree with everything that Marx thought. Absolutely. It means that, um, and uh, you know, I disagree with Marx also, and I disagreed with Marx in the paper and during the conversation about the relationship to the development of the forces of production to revolution, etc. I disagree with Marx about lots of things. I just, uh, in terms of a rigorous Marxist, um, you know, uh, account of periodization, I just mean that, in my opinion, Marx's analysis of capital and the historical categories that he gives us to think about the history of capital enable, um, enable us to uh, think about periodization in a way which is um, much more helpful and much more important than, say, the way that Rancière does. But I'm not interested in proper names. You know, it's not that... Um, uh, it's not that either I agree with Rancière because he's Rancière or I agree with Marx because he's Marx. The question is, like, what actually offers us the tools to think about the relation between modernity, the history of modernity, the history of capital, and the history of art, you know, and literature. And um, in my opinion, Marx's analysis of capital is uh, pretty much the only rigorous analysis of capital that we have. And um, therefore, it offers the tools to think about the history of capital that we need to think about their relation to the history of modernity. Yes, but not of art. Mm. Ah, well, in my opinion, they do offer those tools. So if he doesn't think, if he doesn't think they do, then, uh, then, he's, then in my opinion, he's mistaken. Okay, but, I, mean, I don't have to, it doesn't matter, you know? No, no, okay, fine, but the first part is obvious. Why is Marx useful for the account of Mr. Kaplan, the second move mm. is not so obvious. Which second move? Uh, that it ap applies to the analysis of the aesthetical cultural oh. logic. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, what's not obvious it says that Jameson has already made it, but it's not obvious well, not in, just in Jameson. his analysis either. Not just Jameson, but, you know, no, but all I kinds of people, no. all kinds of every, all kinds of people who do uh, Marxist criticism. In a certain tradition, but Adorno, for example, makes exactly the opposite. Claim. Okay, that's fine. But um, to no, the extent I, that that's true, that's fine. But I, uh, but I, um, uh, the idea that um, that Marx's way of thinking about the history of capitalism doesn't apply to thinking about the history of art. It, what could such a thing possibly I, mean? Whether or not it applies depends on. I didn't say it doesn't apply. I, I just said. No, but you said it's not obvious. No, it remains but, to be shown that it. Yeah. Does. So of course it remains to be. I mean, so the. 
So someone like Jameson offers a certain kind of account of how it applies to the you know, history of late 20th century art. I disagree with the way that he thinks about periodization and the account of the relation between art, uh, the history of art, and the history of capital that he, that he offers. And so I try to transform that a little bit and think about the consequences for historical thought of doing so. But for me, um, uh, uh, to, to, to argue that, um, that aspects of Marx's analysis, that actually um, the way that Marx's categories allow us to think about the history of capital, that, ha that has a very important application to thinking about the history of art. I mean, there may be people who find that controversial, and that's fine, and I'd be happy to argue with them about why, but I'm not, I'm not saying it's a given. I'm just saying, like, I'm giving a Marxist account, you know, of uh, the periodization of aesthetic production, so obviously, um, I think that those categories are useful, yeah. You wanna, you I'm not saying it's a, there's some necessary... Yeah. Well, I actually, quite a while ago, I, I wanted to ask you about the Marxist turned away from, uh, which was the discussion about democracy, yeah. and you uh, 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 and your dismissal of democracy uh, uh, and uh, equality and freedom as ideological notions. Yeah. And you said that you're in accordance with the view here, and so maybe like not right? about equality and freedom, That's about democracy. So, so this is what I wanted to. I mean, the uh, use proposal, and it also in the view, I think democracy has a quite. Uh, um, Ambiguous uh, uh, definition mm -hmm. because I think that, I, I, what I would think that you are referring to is his text uh, that was published within Democracy uh, in Canada, which uh, which talks about a specific uh, uh, I think which is a discussion about a specific period uh, historical period of democracy. Whereas I think that in some some other works we have a completely different notion of what democracy would mean and it would not apply to what he calls capital parliamentarianism. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is what you are being dismissive of. Uh, but then also the, the other point, which I think I would like you to elaborate, and maybe if uh, Peter would like or, or anybody else to, to uh, join into this discussion. Uh, uh, so, but you propose uh, the communist hypothesis, which is closely linked to, to the notion of equality, right? And so, equality as a, as a, as a to me, I see it as a product of, a, of a modernity, of a specific mm -hmm. political processes linked to yeah. modernity. Uh, so, uh, how, uh, uh, I mean, your position would be critical about it. So, why? Well, just, then, yeah. If somebody had a, mm -hmm. a less critical position mm -hmm. about it. Also well, this might allow us to lead into a discussion of Peter's paper, too, and because also this is what we're talking about. This is what his position, right? He but I can, I, can, I can try to answer that, yeah. I mean, I think that the statements by about you that I'm referring to are the kinds of statements where indeed he's talking about, like, the late 20th century and the early 21st century where he says, you know, democracy is like the name of what has to be, you know, opposed today, et cetera. And I agree with that, um, with that proposition and the analysis that it implies, you know, the political conjuncture, basically. Um, and he says that, you know, many times um, in, in many different texts. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, but um, what was I going to say? Ah, so the that, that the communist the hypothesis in Badiou, yeah. yeah. That, um, you know, Badiou's problem, politically, that he tries to think through practically and theoretically, has been, um, what does it mean to have a politics without a party? You know, so he says this, and he says it's a very obscure question. Just as the question of, like, what uh, the communist project involves today is a very obscure question that has to be reinvented, and it has to be reinvented after what he thinks of as a kind of historical and perhaps structural eclipse of the party form um, that he links back to uh, you know, um, the Cultural Revolution. <clears throat> and, uh, and this, I think, is, this, this situates very clearly, I think, um, a problem that has to do with something like the end of modernity and the finitude of modernity, that, um, that the forms of political organization uh, and the, um, and, the, and the political principles and ideals that uh, attend um, the political transformations and the emancipatory transformations of modernity, we can certainly, as Peter insists, and I, I definitely don't disagree, we can learn a great deal from them. And as I say about you know, art objects as well, I want to learn as much as I can from anything. You know, so it's not, uh, that's not really a problem. But the question for Baudieu is something actually has really changed, you know? 
And, uh, and it's very difficult to think about why that is. And that's, I think, um, and that bears upon not only the end of the history of capitalism, uh, the problem of like destroying capitalism um, and producing communism, but it bears equally upon the end of modernity. You know, and that's why I think these questions in Badiou are very important. What is it to think about politics without a party? What is it to like really have done with the figure of the state in the political? Um, what is it to really be confronted with the question of what uh, the production of communism actually entails and what communism is? You know, these, I think, are the really important questions politically today. And I think the reason they're important is because precisely because of the obscurity of what a political uh, field will be like during the sort of dissolution of those social relations which characterize modernity um, and which characterize the relation of modernity to um, the history of capitalism. But would you then also render communism as an idea closer link to modernity? So I've written a... Uh, oh, oh uh, yeah, sure. But it's, but it's one that, uh, it's a self-abolishing you know, notion that arises during modernity, just like the self-abolition of the proletariat. It exactly operates in that way. Communism is something like the self-abolition of modernity. Yeah, I would say something like that. You know, that's I mean, thrown off the top of my head. But uh, but that has a certain logic to me um, that accompanies the figure of uh, the self-abolition of the proletariat in Marx. And what the proletariat is, you know, this question that Peter raised in this passage he objects to in Marx. It's not. Uh, this is not. Maybe in the early writings there's a kind of uh, ontological essentialism in that question, but in the late Marx. <clears throat> What the proletariat is, is it's a purely relational category, as Evan wanted to insist. It's a completely relational category that has to do with the contradiction of the class relations structured by exploitation. And so uh, what the proletariat is, is not uh, this is not an essentialist ontological question, it's a historical question, um, and one that has to be thought in the medium of dialectical contradiction. You know, and so for me, uh, Badiou talks about the idea of communism as an ideal, as a political ideal. And for me, I don't agree with that, you know? So I've written this little piece on Thierry Communiste and their relation to Badiou in which I try to say, like, communization both, like, is and is not an idea of communism, but it's a way of, it's precisely for me, a way of thinking about these questions that Badiou poses. What is a politics without a party? What does a revolutionary process look like in the absence of the seizure of the state? And, uh, and how can we conceive of, um, the production of communism in a way which is, which is radically different than that which is operative during the 20th century. And in my opinion, the reason I'm interested in TC is because they answer these questions, one, two, three, you know, by rethinking the problem of revolution and giving a real theory of it. And I don't think anyone else has done that in the past 40 years, in the period with which Badiou is concerned. Um, I uh, a couple of things I'd like to say. I'd like to end on the question of determinism and come back to this because I don't think we can let you off the hook of determinism so easily, all the same, uh, or at least raise it in more general terms. But a couple, a thing on Monsieur, a thing on Badiou, and then maybe something about this question of the party, um, and to arrive at the question of determinism and Marx and so on. But briefly, you said Monsieur can't accommodate the question of capitalism. I mean, ironically, as I remember, it's certainly not his main concern. But, and why? Well, because he's interested in the experience of people mm -hmm. who suffer communism, right? So he, what he does, in fact, I can think of a couple of passages, I'm not exactly sure where they are, but where he talks about it precisely in terms of accompanied by a set of phenomena associated with development and acceleration of capitalist development, right? So uh, take, take, for instance, his, his stuff on Mallarmé. Um, his book on Mallarmé is, is, is interested in how it is that Mallarmé, not just Zola stuff on supermarkets and stuff, but shopping uh, centers, but, um, but how Mallarmé's poetry internalizes the category of commodification and looks at, looks at it in its modern ephemeral forms and so on and, and yeah. tries to give form to this thing. So is it, is it, but the thing is that at every point, whether it's the Knights of Labor or the stuff on Mallarmé, he pays attention to what people say, what people's experience is, what they say, how, to, how they try to put their experience into their own words and what it is to listen to those words, right? Yeah. And so his question, and, and the violence, that is at stake in someone using their own words and imposing them on them. So a lot of the gestures that you're making of, you know, I'm naming something or, you know, you're, you're and it, I don't, I think you're perfectly entitled to it if it, if it pays off, you know, if it, if it shows, if it exposes things, reveals things, but, but there's certainly a violence in the using of those names and so on and projecting them that certainly Rancière would, would object to and that, that might be in itself an interesting thing. I, um, so for example, just, 
is, for example, the shift from formal to real subsumption, you said, is a naming process. It's a real process. It, you go from the manufacturing system into the factory system, basically. Yeah, but and that's a real, actual process that is driven by real tendencies. Anyway, it's not just a matter of naming. So, so um, you that's, know, that's I, think I, can, I think I can say pretty clearly um, mm -hmm. what Rancière does and doesn't do in relation to Marx. For Marx, in chapter 8, I believe, of volume 1, he talks about the fact that we have to think about um, capitalism in two different ways. And we have to think about the reproduction of the capitalist mode of production in two different ways. We have to think about it on the side of the valorization process, and we have to think about it on the side of the labor process. Now, Rancière is perfectly capable of thinking about it on the side of the labor process, yeah. and he's perfectly capable of listening to what workers say. He is completely incapable of thinking about capitalism on the side of the valorization process. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's unable to offer, and we have to do both of those things, not one. And that's why he's unable to offer a dialectical account, a properly dialectical account of the relation between the history of capitalism and uh, the history of art, or even something like the history of the labor movement. He literally can't understand it. He can understand it in an empiricist register, which is focused on one side of Marx's analysis and not the other. And I would just say that, you know, in that article that I wrote on, uh, on Rancière's book on Althusser, you know, this leads him uh, to really quite colossal um, political misunderstandings. That at the very time, you know, that Rancière is celebrating the occupation of the, the watch factory, the leap factory in Besançon, and saying, like, uh, celebrating their slogan, precisely listening to what the workers say, and they say, we, can we, we make, you know, we sell, we pay ourselves. And, and, you know, Rancière is like, yes, this is like what the man worker has to say if you listen to him, you know, pay attention to Sarah. And this is quite comical, you know, it's, it's in a one way not comical. Of course, uh, being involved in a political sequence means being like involved with everyone involved in it. At the same time, this is quite, I think, a paternalistic um, relation uh, to slogans like that, a refusal, um, simply accepting them on their own terms and, and being completely unable to criticize or think through them and the results that they will lead to. So for example, for Rancière, it's like, great, we're managing our own factory. We, like, we make, we sell, we pay ourselves. Well, look, it only lasts a certain amount of time because uh, actually you have to compete with other capitals in your little watch factory, and that means that um, you know, you're going to have to perform those layoffs that uh, the managers were going to perform in order to like, reproduce um, that capital. And so Rancière is, at the same time that Rancière is completely unable to think through these impasses, we have a text by Negation analyzing the self-managed counter-revolution and saying exactly what the problem in Besançon is and what its structural contradictions are. And why? Because those people who are Thierry Communiste eventually and others are able to think about the valorization process as well as the labor process. And if you don't do that, forget it. Well, yeah. I think Rancière would say that he spent some time working on that in the, in the mid-60s uh, and that he was not a, a, you know, ignorant of it. The question is, do you listen to people? I, I think also his account of lip is a little more complicated than what you suggest. That's part of it. But he also is aware, I think, of the fact that like all the gauche Italian people were of, of how what's happening in LIP and the way they're presenting it is a serious, you know, it means that you can't simply take the easy Maoist line of l'oeil du paysan voit juste, you know, or something like that. You can trust the reflexes of the people, precisely again because they hadn't thought through the category of, the, of, the, of political will, I think. Um, it was a, really a matter of political reflex, un, and precisely uneducated political reflex because it was all about the critique of, it, of the educator. You don't think it has anything to do with not being able to understand the relation of self-management to valorization. It's, I think he can understand the relation, but he wants to. He certainly wants to invert the relation. He doesn't want to. I think he would say, and I personally would agree with him, that the, the figure, the side of the equation that, that is capital claiming for itself the position of being the subject of its own self-valorization is a is a secondary and ultimately fetishistic capital uh, doesn't move. It doesn't claim anything. For it itself. claims that. Sure, it does. In chapter four, he talks about the, the capital positions itself as the subject of its own self-valorization. It, positions itself as the goose that lays golden eggs, right? But it's clearly in an ironic mode, and I think Marx, I think people like to sell and others who read this, Harvey too for that matter, uh, as, a, as essentially a secondary phenomenon. What it fundamentally is, is the relation of expectation, as you said. And then, so I think Rancière broadly is in line with that, although he, he's not, he, you know, his fundamental thing is listening to people, and that's true. But who's going to argue with such a thing? It's, it's really quite astonishing.
Uh, who's going to say no? We shouldn't listen to any of the people. Well, hang on. I mean, but it's, you're it's not. Like, there's no. Like, no, I'm not saying that at all. Yeah, you're saying it. You're, for example, the question of democracy. So let's take this I'm question. I'm not saying that. So Bad Badu gets himself in a contradiction. On one hand, he says we should listen to these people in Tahrir Square. They are the Egyptian nation. Here they are. They've constituted themselves, and they have claimed the right, and the pra and they are practicing this, the the way they've constituted themselves as le peuple égyptien. You know, they they are there in person, not through the logic of parliamentary. You know, representation and so on. And what are they saying? And then the question is, well, so what are these people saying? Do we should we listen to them? And one of the things they're saying, they're saying multiple things, but is that we want democracy. We want an end to autocracy. We want a bunch of boring old liberal freedoms, along with the various other things. Yeah. And that is part of what they're saying. By the way, it's what they're saying also in Bolivia and Venezuela and other places. Of course. Okay. There's a difference between there's a difference between well, um, being able to recognize and analyze the limitations of a certain political position and not listening to people. Actually, listening to what people say in these situations and in political situations in which one is directly involved is a condition of possibility for thinking through what the structure and the limitations of a particular political sequence are. So the idea that like, if one doesn't agree that yes, the people of Tahrir Square are absolutely right to uh, say, we want democracy rather than we want communism, it doesn't mean that I, if I think that actually uh, there are limitations to what they're saying, that I'm not listening to them. But I mean, this is, a, this is a kind of normative argument. But you can say that really a bunch of people are demonstrating for a misguided demand in Terry Square, and they're entitled to that. They I would never say them. such a foolish thing. All right, but by yeah. you saying they are constituting themselves as the sovereign people, they are investing themselves with the power to <coughs> make, basically to make, you know, to, to lay down laws for that, will, that should be Self, you know, that, should, that would be taken on as uh, principles that people would obey in a form of sovereign self-government, something like that, right? And if then, you can't both say that and say that they shouldn't be calling for what they're actually calling for. It seems to me you really have to make a no decision. One is, no one is saying they shouldn't be saying what they're saying. They are saying what they're saying. What, a, what effect does saying they shouldn't be saying it have to do with anything? The question is to think about it historically. That's all. And, and that means not accepting carte blanche that what they say is right and true just because they say it. And that it's, that it's like the, the necessarily correct thing to say and that it doesn't have political limitations. Mm -hmm. To think about something historically is not, to be, is not to say someone should be saying something else than what they're saying right now. It's to recognize what they're saying in its context, in its limits, and to situate it within those. Okay. On the topic of listening, can you please let Peter finish his response? Like, yeah, but I'm also trying to respond to particular things that he's saying before they get lost, you know? Um, the, the, there's one thing about critically engaged, to listen is indeed to critically engage with and so on, and, and you can easily point out, and the people in Jerry Square know this perfectly well, what the limitations of certain capitalist parliamentary models of democracy are. That, but it's another thing to say that you, what you're calling for is essentially the, and, you know, the fundamental enemy of our time, you know, that, that, that you're calling for an illusion that another context he talks about is kind of pre-Euclidean, He'll say, for example, that the Maoist sequence of the 1920s already demonstrated that the ideals that have motivated the Bolivarian Revolution are the political equivalents of like pre-Euclidean delusion. Uh, and that, is a, that, in my opinion, is, a, is an incapacity to engage with what is actually happening there. Also a total indifference um, to it. Uh, and, and it's that kind of... It, so what, what, what strikes me about this... So take the question of the, the party. So yes, politics without a party, we have to abandon the party form. The question is why yeah, has he reached this conclusion? You could say that... Well, because, and the real reason I think in his case is that because a certain trajectory of the Revolutionary Party from Lenin to Stalin to Mao failed to salvage itself, and the Cultural Revolution was its last gasp, and it didn't work, right? It was still too compromised by the form of the state, and it basically imploded and destroyed itself. You could make another claim, though, which is the party, why did the party become an, an important form uh, for the communist movement, for example? And it, it became so mainly in Germany because the SPD had the prospect of winning electoral power, right? In other words, it was growing, it had momentum, Le you know, Engels is very optimistic, Kautsky and company are very optimistic, Lenin is very impressed, it's clearly the model for the Russian party. And this is because they can win the battle of democracy, not because it's the end of politics, but because they can win the argument, because they are convincing, because they are also listening and taking people seriously. They don't, they're not, in no way contemptuous of universal suffrage or anything like that. They simply say universal suffrage can, is a neutral form. It can be used for reactionary purposes. It can, be, it can be the form for fundamental political argument. And we have to have the argument. 
Now, on that level, you could say, well, what has changed exactly? The fact that left-wing parties have failed to gain you know, more than 5-10% of the vote, in some cases in Britain, not even 1% of the vote, does that mean that, therefore, the party forum is compromised and we should abandon it? Or does it, does it mean that we're not winning the argument, and in, in large part because the forum of the argument is itself compromised? In other words, the parliamentary system, as it's regulated now, is itself compromised. You can have a critique of that, yes. It doesn't follow that you drop the figure of the party completely. In other words, something that, that involves grassroots mobilization, certain institutions like trade unions and other forms of organization, grassroots organization, with something that is geared towards taking state power, because, you can, because taking state power is still useful. And the real, you know, my opinion anyway, uh, of course it doesn't feel bad you. Um, and that, so that's a, that's a slightly different question, it seems to me. Uh, and part of the reason why the abandoned party, I think, but use abandoned party, is that they are not prepared to engage in the, in the work of public conviction, you know, of, of, public, of winning the argument at a mass level. And part of that is, I think, hard to separate from a certain contempt for what, what people think, or what people are, are talking about and engaged with. And he's not, he's frankly just not that interested, and his whole concept of truth is consistent with this. Why should he be interested if, if truth is understood in the way that he conceives it? It's not really fundamentally, in other words, fundamentally mediated by what people are actually willing and thinking, however false the consciousness is, however deluded it is and compromised it is by this or that form. And that, for me, there's no shortcut. That, that is where you have to work, is, is in what people are actually doing and thinking. So I'll just, I'm going to end with this quote from Marx, I'm wondering you know, how, how you see it. But for me, again, there's a side of Marx that's perfectly compatible with this taking people seriously, basically. And there's another side that's a lot less. And I, it's striking that in Capital, of course, Capital is a, is a book about a specific kind of thing, but nevertheless, the climax of the book, chapter 32, and I'll, I'll just read one sentence, but which is, this is the chapter on the historical tendency of capitalist accumulation. So after he's talked about primitive accumulation, and this is the passage of, that clim you know, it's the climax of the communist moment, the expropriation of the expropriators, and so on. And it's hard to read it in terms of not deterministic, I think. Uh, he talks about how, for example, the mode of production reaches a certain point of contradiction. It has to be, quote, it has to be annihilated, it is annihilated. Or again, this expropriation, now talking about the expropriation of, of, of capitalist private property. So in other words, the move to communism, as you put it, this expropriation is accomplished through the action of the uh, imminent laws of capitalist production itself, dot, 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 with the inexorability of a natural process. Now, if you understand that kind of process of expropriation on the model of an inexorable natural process, deliberately in order to exclude the domain, for example, of conscious intentions and the choosing of, of uh, aims and ends and the whole Kantian business of you know, determining your own ends and so on, then you're introducing a real tension, it seems to me. It, it, it seems like you know, Marx doesn't have to do that. He could say that they're, the two things are bound up with each other or they're mutually co-implied or correlated or but he quite explicitly, I think, uh, opts not to do that. Um, and it does invite, I think, the notion of determinism. And my question for you then is, the way that you talk about the move towards communism as essentially the self-destruction of capitalism, you know, on one level, that certainly creates the conditions. I think this is the old condition causal question again. Capitalism has to reach a point of impasse. But if you, if you fully accept what Marx says about how you know, a mode of production uh, it can't be overthrown until it's exhausted all of its possibilities, then you're, you're just giving capitalism itself the power to determine when it exhausts itself. I mean, that, that's a concession that I would never be prepared to make. I mean, why? We have no idea, the truth is. You talk about late modern, you know, late modernity as if it's, it declines imminent. There are symptoms, but they could easily be wrong. I mean, it's way too, it's, it's far too speculative to, to know it. We can't possibly leave it to capitalism to kill itself off. It'll have to be killed. I mean... But who is, who is doing such a thing? I mean, who's so, 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 the, so, no, who's, who's uh, just letting capitalism hang out and not struggling against it? So the, so the, the question is, um, you know, uh, <laughs> Marx says for structural reasons that uh, the history of capital is finite. It has a beginning and it will end. And that has to do with its structural contradictions. Fine. The, to call that, now, what he says about it, like, ending like a natural process, though, well, there are many different passages on this kind of thing in Marx, you know, so we could go back and forth like Marxologists and we could countersight and whatever, it's not interesting. But to think about the fact that um, there is a very important relation between something like the structural breakdown of capital on a systematic level yeah. and the capacity 
to struggle against capitalism in such a way that will end it. That is to say, to struggle at a level which is not just a national liberation struggle, or is not just a takeover of the factory, etc., but that actually precipitates the end of capitalism. That that requires certain objective historical conditions which do have to do with the structural finitude of capitalism as a mode of production. So, you know, these, these, uh, these um, questions which seem so dramatic about the determinism of Marx's account. It's like, well, he says capitalism is finite, and he says it's important to think about the end of capitalism and struggling for the end of capitalism in relation to its structural finitude. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, about the question of, of um, you know, the party, I just think, uh, and again, it's not that I want to defend everything about you says, and I, th I think you're, you know, I don't know, actually, what his particular opinions are on sequences in Bolivia and Venezuela, and I don't particularly care. But I think that... Um, that what he's talking about in terms of uh, um, the exhaustion of the party form, one can very well support the political sequence in, in Venezuela and the particular way in which it's playing itself out and think about the historical reasons why it's playing itself out in a certain way and be perfectly supportive of, uh, of Chavez and you know, of that political sequence. At the same time as one can say, well, the real political question of the day, from a communist perspective, mm -hmm. not a state socialist perspective, is the question of how politics without a party is possible. And the real theoretical problem and the real practical problem is to develop forms of organization and to develop theories of revolution which think through certain impasses in the party form. Now one can perfectly well think responsibly and historically about what's happening in the world today and support political sequences which don't align with you know, the idea that party form is totally exhausted. And one can say, well, this isn't, you know, there are like, if one is interested in the destruction of the state, if one thinks that communism entails the destruction of the state, which Marx does, and I agree, then there are good reasons to think that there are real limitations to the kind of sequence which is playing itself out in Venezuela. Or at least there are ways of siding with aspects of that sequence which will ultimately prove to be anti-state and which might be, you know, have the capacity to uh, disarticulate something like a party as a leader of that movement. Can yeah. I come so I think that I think that the question is complicated, and it's not uh, an either-or thing. It involves modes of historical thought that are overdetermined and and complex. But that to say, you know, the question of communism resides in something like the question of politics after a party. That that's what I want to think about. That that's what I think is the real question. I agree with that. You know, oh, it no. doesn't, and it doesn't involve saying like people in Venezuela who are Chavistas are totally misled. I mean... Just um, one, and then actually maybe it comes a bit to your, your question about the communist hypothesis, but I mean, on one thing where Nathan and I, I think, do um, share a position, or at least I get accused of being a catastrophist a lot. I mean, I think one of the things um, that's interesting about, let's say something like, uh, a notion of communism as something like the articulated negation of capitalism rather than a form of kind of seizure and and then post-revolutionary transition is that you know I think the reason why I basically share a kind of a version of this position uh, while still thinking that that's going to be incredibly ferocious difficult work where people yeah. have to engage in and massively organized and you know if ultimately some of that's called party or not I'm relatively open to, to this but for me, the particularity about this optic that has a certain traction right now um, is that I think it's shown itself able to take a set, take its um, cues or its kind of bearings from a set of, of previously kind of unforeseen conditions that a lot of socialist and communist organizing kind of thought itself on. So here's a, a very clear example would be, you know, it seems weird now in a, for, for many of us, I think, but you know, up until about 60s or 70s, barring a, a different kind of anarchist, and especially insurrectionary anarchist current, you know, all the vast majority of Marxists really thought that we had to like build up productive means, as Nathan mentioned, as much as possible to free ourselves from work via technological, you know. And so it's only really in the 60s that you get, especially by a, a set of these Italians like Panzieri and Alquati, and people who start saying, eh, all of these things we took as neutral or potentially objective, like factory structure, etc., they're not. In fact, they're class technologies. They were designed in that. Maybe we'll scrap them, maybe some we'll use. But the point is that, you know, the question of labor that was such a central grounding for so much of kind of communist thought until at least the mid-century has shown itself even stranger because now we're in a period where 
It's increasingly implausible to think that we would organize on the basis of trade when in fact the predominant issue is how to get people able to reproduce themselves without work. You know what I found really perverse about a certain kind of SWP position was like defend the right to work. You know, for me it seems like in a time we know when employment is dropping, at least in the sort of uh, you know, global north, or access to and we're having huge generations who simply can't access that, it seems quite perverse to think that we would make that the kernel that we then try to kind of radicalize within unions that, you know, for very good reasons are pretty defensive of their members and not particularly radical for the most part. So the point of this other politics would be saying, would be just something like, or this anti-politics I think, would be, to be, would be to say something like, one takes one's bearings or kind of compass markers off the basis of the, um, the disintegrating, uh, where capital's uh, reproduction and social relations are disintegrating and where one looks in towards that is that there are forms of struggle in which you can't make a divide between the act of doing politics and the acts of trying to kind of weather that storm. So for example, things like direct appropriation of, uh, like looting of supermarkets and things like that is an interesting thing because that's the moment where people are simultaneously defying the police, breaking, albeit temporarily, or suspending the law of value and becoming a collective force in a way they were not previously. So, you know, for people like me who put a lot of emphasis on, on things like kind of like looting, the riot, certain forms of criminality, etc., mm -hmm. it has to do with understanding that, you know, we're not in a period where the reproduction of capital is particularly healthy. Will we have to kill it? Absolutely. But there's ways in which it's not a sort of, you know, as I think Nathan was right to periodize in this way, you know, the post-war boom is one where basically the, the global north can absorb a huge saturation of labor in ways it hadn't been able to previously. That's not the case now, both in north and south. And so, you know, I think there's the idea of a kind of negative understanding of, of communism that has to do with how do we work collectively by means of totally mass organization, because it has to be that, in order to sever the bonds of coherence that includes between state and capital, that includes between capital and family, that is between like gender and labor, right? How do you sever these ties so that a takeover of them becomes possible and a ruination of them? But the first process of that is one that involves basically a form of taking your cues from uh, the, the kind of points of decomposition. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Well, I have a question, I mean, a standard, Maybe. totally political question, a basic Trotsky's question, I guess, which is, Good. let's say you start this process, so you loot some, you know, however it starts, let's but take the figure of, you know, looting supermarkets and other forms of, you know, mass mobilization that have a somewhat ephemeral form, but that could yeah. be organized in something more substantial. Well, then you have an empty supermarket and you have, you have predictable, you know, you can imagine exactly what the police reaction is going to be and the press reaction and the government mm -hmm. reaction. And then, then either, uh, then let's say if things go well, you get into something more and more like a civil war, right? Yeah. So, and, and the, it'll be, as for, like Nathan mentioned, it'll be utterly ferocious, right? So you will, you know, it'll be, you will inherit a situation that will be very comparable to the one that Lenin and Trotsky are staring at in 1920, which is basically a scorched earth, right? totally. The reason why they adopt Taylorism, as Linhart you know, demonstrates well in a, in a complicated way with some reservations all the same, is that it's, you have to feed the countryside. You know, the cities, if, if the cities don't produce industrial goods and goods for the countryside, uh, and the countryside doesn't pr produce the food for the cities, then you have mass famine and starvation, which is indeed what happens. And, and in that kind of context, you're, uh, you need, I, I'm just, I, just, I can see what they managed to do with incredible discipline and all kinds of sacrifice and all kinds of problems, but with a, with a very powerful state. In early, you know, in the early 1920s in Russia, yeah. I just can't imagine. I just, I would like to be able to envisage what you're calling for that doesn't reinvent the wheel, that doesn't reinvent some kind of state, and probably in a way that's going to be a bit more murky and complicated than the neo russo East one, which says, of course, you have to have a government, you have to have something to execute public decisions, and we need to keep it under c control. We need, in other words. And, and that we need to we need to do this by winning people over, basically by 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 winning the argument, and not by allowing ourselves to be basically divided and ruled, infiltrated very easily, set against each other. I mean, this, the techniques that the police have in their in their favor now are just overwhelming. I mean, but isn't it isn't it interesting when and where one chooses to say we have to listen to the people? When the people say, you know, liberty and equality, we want democracy in Tahrir Square, then we have to listen to them. But when people burn down the Sony warehouse in London, then it's like, ah, this is not a, polit you know, a, a productive political strategy or tactic. So actually these people need to be shepherded and organized and uh, they need to organize themselves. Oh, but look what they're actually doing. 
Riots are a form of speech. Looting is a form of speech. This is when one also has to listen to the people. You know, not just when they say what we think they should say. Not just when they organize themselves very methodically in Montreal. You know, and that's what it is to think historically. Not only what happens in Montreal, but what happens in London two summers ago. And why that's like real and why it will continue to happen and why it does have something to do with the breakdown of capitalism and why it will be integrally involved. So that is to say, there's not one way in which like revolution is going to take place. It's going to take place in ways which are very organized and it's going to take place in ways which are extremely chaotic and which will lead to civil wars and which will lead to massive repressive crackdowns and which will lead to fascist reactions. And you think those wars can be won without, by, by basically using the figure of the, of the dissolution of the proletariat as opposed to the consolidation of... of they can't um, be won from any theoretical position. But we can, we can, we can, we cannot, what? and this is my problem with the party politics, we cannot impose and educate and organize through uh, a, a theoretical position. We have to think structurally at the same time as we are immersed in plays of forces and political situations which never correspond to what we think or what we want. And yes, of course, sometimes one has to press organization and other times one has to say, let's burn down the fucking building, you know? And, and there's no way of like uh, saying that one way or the other is like the correct line. And this is the real impasse of Trotskyist politics when it rears its ugly head in the way that it did after those riots in London. The absolutely disgusting statements of Trotskyist in England about what happened and the completely paternalistic attitude that they took towards what happened, you know? That doesn't follow from uh, not, not listening to people. What people who are burning down, making, you know, who are directly attacking, for example, the police, who are directly attacking certain government policy, were also saying things like, uh, we we reject you know what's happened to education. We reject what of course the way the police are being used in our states and so on. They were saying those things too. And they, yeah. they, the question is then so how all right that's what you're saying. How would you, how do we turn what you're saying into an actuality? How do we concentrate our power so that we can change this? We that we, is the immediate way of listening to them. And that's what it that's what it involves. And just standing simply standing around saying great you know you you burned down a few buildings. Uh, and uh, that makes a point, yes, and it, I, I defend the point as far as it goes. I also think it's a, a very weak way of making that point. It's better okay. than nothing. But, but if one were in London, that's what's, you know, uh, hopefully one would be participating in that sequence. And if you want, attempting to move it in a certain direction, one way or another. But certainly not, but this, these questions that people are posing, you know, I hear like Trotskyists in London saying like, ah, we have to decide actually whether we, we're going to side with these neighborhood committees protecting these like businesses and homes or whether we're going to side with the rioters and we are siding with like these neighborhood committees. You know, this is a fascist reactionary position. And so the way that one like participates in those sequences is to actually participate in them. And when you do, you know, one finds very rapidly that what you think doesn't matter very much. And so of course, like in any sequence, uh, you try to like, um, make your analysis matter in a way that is not uh, top-down and in a way which has effects but that also listens to people and participates in the situation. But the way in which one does that is so contingent and local at the same time as it does, in my opinion, you know, force a kind of structural thought which makes some sense of burning down but you're a right. Sony warehouse and says this is a completely articulate um, tactic. So you're hoping to fight a, what will be a structural, deliberate, organized, strategic war with local contingent means. You'll lose. You'll lose very fast. What is winning and losing? Winning. I don't even understand it's these terms beautiful. in history. I, I don't think they. Um, I don't think uh, struggles are won or lost. But. I, I mean, I just to add to this uh, discussion. I think uh, now we're talking about the field of strategy, and I think if you talk about like smart political strategy in a specific situation, you you cannot. Be entirely. Uh, you cannot entirely dismiss every possible form of organization that can be at the moment lucrative for 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 the cause. Uh, and, and in that sense, I would maybe. I mean, Greece would be a good example now, right? Because you have a grassroots movement that at one point is organized into a party, which is now you know fighting really fiercely to to for to form well, government. 
unfortunately, but you know, it's, it's there, it's a, it's a recognized party. But at the same time, you still have grassroots movements, you still have people looting banks and, you know, taking over broadcasting public, uh, public TV and, you know, doing all these things organized, but not, but in this current political situation, you know, the fact that Syriza exists is also very, very, I mean, very important and cannot be just rendered like, oh, this, you know, you cannot just say, oh, you know, the party form is that. And sure, sure, not, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, I, I, think, I think, you know, we, we need to, uh, uh, I think uh, when you talk about a question of strategy, you you always, I think, as, as Peter was pointing out at the, the, the talk about revolutions, you, you think you have to think through constantly what is what is uh, 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 necessary in the, in the current situation. And then, you know, when you are, of course, uh, uh, faced with the limits of, of that position and with the reaction that you get, then you have to think through that and think of other forms. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so um, closed. <laughs> no, but it's... Even, but it's... Even, even, if we, uh, even though I, I totally you know, I agree with the entire critique of, of the party form organization, and I agree, and, and I mean, it has reached a certain limit within the specific parameter of politics that we have lived in the last century. But, but I, I don't think that we have to be, you know, completely... Yeah, I mean, I think that's... I, I think it's a really important point. I mean, this is um, maybe getting a bit far afield from some topic. But no, no, it's not... I mean, not, not your comment. I mean, these thoughts. But there's a... There is a way, and kind of... I guess I want to kind of come back to your question a little bit, where I think um, the game of... Uh, you know, there is no left today. I think that's a kind of a phantasm. There are coalition forces, but the idea, you know, for me, I think the problem would be that we primarily concern ourselves with trying to censor or direct forms that we think are like a bit too socialist or a bit too anarch or whatever. It seems to me the point is like one needs all forms of everything and all. For, and I actually do think that things like uh, leftish ish parliamentary um, parties are actually, I have zero interest in them, you know, they'll be destroyed in the process, but like they, f they do serve very useful things. Yeah, they actually true. will like get lower jail sentences for activists. So, you know, as to the, the question I think about, you know, um, there's, there's kind of two big ones. One has to do with the question of the national framing, which is something I actually wanted to ask you about if we have time. Um, uh, but, you know, for example, so like, um, like anarchists, you know, I know in Greece, like in Athens, etc. I mean, the, the level of organization they have, you know, would dwarf most sort of parliamentary or representation parties. I mean, like, massive structures of uh, self-care, of publicity, like 5,000 flyers out every Monday, you know, like these, these sort of really advanced apparatus. Yeah, so I think, you know, it seems like the real, the question that you're asking is like, how do we avoid something that looks like, I think it's a very good question, like when the supermarket's empty, what do you do next? Well, you know, one answer, of course, is that you try in a serious way to actually, I do think, organize these processes. Like, you know, while I have um, will always speak against kind of condemnation of looters, like, I don't think it's a reactionary position to be able to say simultaneously, like, you know, of course, you're like, you have every right to like, you know, not even right, the point is it destroys right, like, of course, you're like a pissed off poor kid who's been shit on the cops your whole life, like, do that. But I don't think it gives up, you know, it shouldn't restrict the capacity to have a critical voice of saying like, and how much better it would be if they hit like a police station. And not because it's better than the cops, but like in terms of an actual revolutionary strategy, you know? And that there's, so what's at stake I think in a lot of this, weirdly enough, in, to link it back to cultural stuff, is something to do with like a mode of reading. I think is weirdly the question of it. It's like, how do you sort of read these landscapes? And try to understand, instead of, I mean, that's the thing that's at stake in, in Nathan's question. But, I'm losing it for here. What I did want to ask more particularly for you is like, uh, to what degree is there the, the fact that many of the struggles you're talking about use the notion of the people, which was basically defined by the nation in question, although I agree it kind of extends more widely, but nevertheless it was, you know, it is a French revolution, it's understood in that. Mm -hmm. To what degree, you know, when you're talking about now our party, et cetera, like do you see this, the nation as a transitional form of organizing? Like, British communists, America, et cetera, is something that's a positive form or something that's better scrapped in forms of actually local organizations that are not trade-based, nation-based, or political party-based, but actually on things of like zones of the city where one lives, forms of association otherwise. Yeah. For me, it's just trans the, the issue is what is the pertinent sphere in which a, something like a collective will can be yeah. organized, articulated, implemented. And that, so the, if you think the terms will and people together, I mean, our people, what is it that makes a, our people a people? Well, 
you can either think it in terms of certain predicates, you know, it has a language or a history or a territory or something, uh, which is how, say, Carl Schmitt thinks yeah. it has an essence or something like that. And it's will that expresses what it is, expresses its essence or something. Uh, the other way is saying, well, there, there is a certain sphere in which a collective power can be assembled and associated. And that's a practical question. What is its capacity? How big is it? How far does it go? It might go as far as Geneva, it might go as far as Sparta, it might go as far as the Roman Empire, it might go as far as the entire world. And there's no reason. It's a, it's a simple, the question is, what is its capacity? And the, the category of the people is just, you know, is then in inclusive of everyone who can participate in the formulation of that will without any criterion apart mm -hmm. from participation and with one exclusion, which is the exclusion of all those who might try to oppress or exploit, exploit them. And those are your two terms. So that rules out any fascistic deviation, I think, and it rules out any, part any particular chauvinist conception of a will. Mm -hmm. uh, it also rules out, because you're thinking the category of the people through the will, it rules out a kind of Schmittian essentialist position, conception of the people. And then the category of people itself, simply, is one that does, I think, open up to you know, just people. That's it, with, you know, humanity as a whole, or something like that. So that the, there's no inner reason why any of these revolutions should stop at, you know, at the natural frontiers of a nation state or something like that. And they were never conceived that way, they were never thought that way. Yeah, I was just thinking of sort of unfortunate instances like um, the French Communist Party's waffling, to put it nicely, over support of Algerian revolutionaries because of worries of alienating like what they understood as the French working class people. So there's just, it's just said like it's a really fraught history, of course, in terms of a... Well, like any category, yeah. yes, indeed. Yeah. So the nation can then very easily, and Fanon analyze this very well, how, how a re maybe a revolutionary nationalism can be turned into the exact opposite. Um, it's, the, the will is a dialectical category in the very ordinary sense that it will tend to become its opposite if you don't correct it. So, and the same thing with the people, it can easily invert itself. So it's, this is why there's, there's no shortcut. It's a, whatever you want, whether you want to call it virtue or something else, there's, there's the need for this constant self-correcting process. Um, I, but I think that there's no reason why, and you see it a bit in the Bolivarian process, there was a moment of the sort of pan-Africanist moment that I think was very important and very threatening and therefore it was shut down mm. very quickly. Uh, the Haitian example is a really interesting one because the effort to quarantine the Haitian Revolution was a big effort again. Um, and because these things are, you know, and generate enthusiasm and inspire imitation and, you know, like a bit like Chomsky says too, but the virus of self-determination, you know, it's a, it's a, and power goes to a lot of trouble to stifle that for precisely the reason that people, you know, are not naturally confined to their ethnic or natural, you know, national, national or chauvinistic horizons. We should probably retire. It's, yeah, we're through two hours already, right? Yeah, almost two hours. <laughs>